Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the Energy Trilemma Report. This event is a collaboration between the World Energy Council's Swedish Member Committee and the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, EVA. My name is Maya Neyman, and my role today is to guide you to three distinguished speakers. This year, the World Energy Council's Energy Trilemma Index Report is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Since 2010, the report has provided an independent and objective assessment of the energy policies and performances of countries based on glo both global and national data, with a focus on three core dimensions, energy security, energy equity, and environmental sustainability. The World Energy Trilemma Index enables countries to keep track of their own progress as well as to learn from each other. And in 2020, Sweden ranked second place out of the 108 countries analyzed, which we of course want to highlight and celebrate. Today we will listen to three experts from three different perspectives. First off, we have the author of the Trilemma Report, and the Senior Director from the World Energy Council, Martin Young, who will give us an international perspective of the report and also a more detailed analysis of the Nordic countries. We will later on listen to Klaus Hamme, Chief Economist of the Sweden, Sweden Energy Agency, and his comment of the report from a Swedish perspective and also his views of the future. Last but not least, we will listen to Professor Lina Bertling Kjernberg, from the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH. She will provide a concluding summary with an analysis of which trends we can see from a more technical perspective. During all presentations, you have the possibility to post questions to the speakers. You go to the website menti.com and you enter the code 72967740. You can find the code on the website of this event as well. So you go to menti.com and enter the code 72967740. And you can post questions at any time. So you are all most welcome. And we start the webinar by giving the word to Martin Young. Good morning, everyone. and. Um... I'm delighted to have the opportunity to discuss the, uh, the trilemma and the council's uh, latest version of the World Energy Trilemma. Um, hopefully I can have my first slide up, please. So I'm a bit useless without my slides that I, so you can actually then see what I'm talking about. Um, let me just begin by saying uh, it's, thank you to um, Maya for the, the kind words. Um, if we move on to the first slide, um, I am just one of the authors, but my team, I lead the team that um, produce it. Um, if I begin with a little bit of background to the World Energy Council, um, we were established in 1923-24 um, as the world's first energy community. And at that time, we were thinking, well, the world was thinking about rebuilding after the First World War, uh, also rebuilding after the first global pandemic. And the real focus on it was about electrification. Um, the key things to really note about the council are that we are non-political, um, we are impartial and technology neutral. Move on to the next slide. When we were founded, we were really focusing on trying to improve electrification. So looking about diversity of supply and the development of better technologies. In the last few years, we've been focusing really on looking at the three global drivers um, for, de uh, for the energy transition, the three Ds being decarbonisation, decentralisation and digitalisation. Now, in the World, at the World Energy Congress in, in 2019 in Abu Dhabi, a fourth D appeared from the conversations, um, and this was what we've called disruption, but it's really demand disruption. And it's looking about the three other Ds, the decarbonisation, decentralisation, digitalisation, all affecting and impacting upon um, the energy transition and changing how demand um, operates. Now, the Council has um, our World Energy Transition Toolkit. 
Now, this uh, consists of four different tools. Now, it looks at past, present, and future. But unfortunately, my dog is being a pain in the background, so hopefully uh, she will calm down. Um, in the past, we have the, the, tri the trilemma. So this looks at historic data, it looks at the, uh, how policies are performing, and so you can, can then see what are, the right, what are the right areas to focus on. And so it's really trying to be a, an integrated policy pathfinding tool. Sorry, can we go back? Um, the second tool that we have is our World Energy Issues Monitor. This is an annual survey of 2,500 people, energy leaders, and it's really trying to find out what are the emerging issues in the energy world? What are the areas that we should be focusing on and what are the ones that are coming up that where it should be further attention? For the future aspect, we have our world energy scenarios. These look out to 2040, 2060, and they look at the potential futures that there might be. We, we operate with three different um, scenarios, um, one where there's collaborative uh, government-led world, one where there's um, bottom-up industry-led world, and then one there's, there's more fragmentation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about scenarios very briefly. Um, and then the, the final one is our Innovations Insights tool. Now, from some of the signals that we pick up, either from scenarios or issues monitor, we then delve into areas um, in more detail. So last year, we produced a report on the transmission grid. Uh, we also did one on energy storage. And we are about to start work on hydrogen. Next slide, please. So just to say that um, obviously we are clearly affected by the pandemic at the moment. Um, and the crisis doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's exposing that we are going to be experiencing an economic recession, um, some more than others. There's also the climate change momentum and the pandemic has helped expose societal unevenness, which means that the policies uh, for energy transition need to be looked at more seriously so that you can make sure that everyone buys in and we have a fairer energy transition. Next slide, please. So the first area I wanted to very briefly touch upon is our scenarios work. Now, as I mentioned before, we normally look out to 2040, 2060, but what we've been doing last year has been very much on a, on a short term scale, looking out to 2024. We've done this with a couple of um, surveys of our membership. We're about to launch a new survey next month which is try to understand the impact on the energy sector of the, of the virus. How has it affected operations? How it's affected thing, um, investment plans? From this, we drew up some short-term scenarios, um, looking at degrees of collaboration, um, whether you want to go to, uh, you, you want to global uh, cooperation, or if you're going to have much more insular local um, uh, plans. And then the other um, dimension that we look at on the scenarios, whether you want to go to pre-pandemic uh, agenda or if you want to a much more transformative, high ambition agenda. Now, those uh, scenarios, we, we track them in our World Energy Transitions radar. So this is where people, if they can see a signal, if a new story about a new policy, can say we think that aligns to one of the different four scenarios. We also have piloted... Um, at our World Energy Leaders Summit, a role-playing exercise where um, energy leaders and ministers could actually pretend uh, role-play the uh, either investor, business, government, or civil society, and that was really useful to get them to see uh, how their perspective actually compared with the transitions radar. And on the next slide, you will see the the transitions radar. This is as of the the first of November. Um, I did look on our website the other day. It's not too different. The key thing here is really to see how uh, the transition has and the impact of the virus is actually very different um, global perspectives, regional perspectives. The re-record scenario and the fast forward scenario, both are high ambition scenarios. So you want to transform beyond what we were doing before. The difference between them is on fast forward, we're looking more at a collaborative future and re-record is much more insular, looking to try to um, do these on your own. And I'd highlight here India. India's got a, 
half of its signals are focusing on the re-record. So it's high ambition, but it's not looking very collaboratively. Um, look at China, there's a rewind scenario. Now, rewind scenario is low collaboration and low ambition. It's back to the, the pre-pandemic agenda, and that's the largest one there. So you can see that there's very different viewpoints. So I'd encourage, if you have a few moments, to go to the Council's website and to look at our World Energy uh, Transitions radar. Move on to the next slide. Again, I just want to highlight very briefly, this is our um, World Energy Issues Monitor. The next survey comes out um, next month and we'll be launching. We're writing it up at the moment. Um, we have two and a half thousand respondents. I think one and a half thousand are senior management or C-suite. Uh, so some really interesting stories coming up from that. We've got a number of individual maps for countries. Um, don't think we managed to have enough responses from Sweden this year, but I hope we can encourage that we can get further responses for you for next year. So uh, that'll just be one interesting one to, be, to you to look forward to. Next slide. So we're now going to go into the trilemma. As helpfully been highlighted by Maya, we've been looking at the World Energy uh, Trilemma Index now for 10 years. Um, it started out trying to look at uh, sustainability, but it, then it broadened out and we've gradually improved it and finessed it. It's those uh, who hear me on a regular basis say that uh, we constantly seek to improve the trilemma because it's, it needs to keep evolving. It needs to keep getting feedback from um, our membership and the stakeholders to see how we can better uh, make it reflect reality. Um, as Maya highlighted at the start, the, uh, the trilemma looks at three different dimensions. So we look at energy security, uh, it's looking at total primary energy supply, it's looking at the diversity of power generation, uh, whether a country is an importer or an exporter of energy, uh, it's, oil, uh, it's oil stocks, that's very historic, old school, also looks at um, gas stocks. Um, we have some work trying to look at how we might incorporate electricity storage. It's not there yet. And a little bit about sustainability, um, sorry, resilience. Um, under energy equity, um, this looks at, uh, it's aligned to UN SGD 7. So very much about uh, access to um, clean energy and clean cooking. Uh, and it also then looks at um, prices. So it, the score tends to be a lot higher on this one, um, but it's very much a skewed distribution because we have a lot of countries um, who have near 100% access. And the final one, the final dimension is environmental sustainability. It looks at um, low carbon energy production um, and the uh, CO2 emissions. Um, I should just... Uh, Correct uh, an earlier point that uh, Maya highlighted. Sweden came number came second in the overall trilemma, and it was out of we have 133 countries in the trilemma, so uh, even better. Um, move on to the next slide, please. And we can. This was the highlights um, from last year. We we grade the countries so. Um, not only do uh, you get a, a score for each dimension, we have an overarching score, but for the dimensions we also grade them so they're. A is the, the top and D is the bottom. Um, we only had eight countries in total that had the triple A uh, score. I should just briefly add, there is a, a fourth dimension, but that's country context and it helps us to group the countries, but it only counts the 10% of the trilemma. This last year, we introduced tied rankings. Now, this was because um, when you look at the, the scores, some of them, when you go down to, to one decimal place, are the same. Um, and trying to split them on the ranking becomes a little bit arbitrary. So we think it's much better to actually have the tied um, ranks. And we then can show that there's this broader diversity here. But as you can see, for the, the top 10 ranks, we very much have rich OECD, IEA um, countries um, reflecting the, um, with also with a very strong and perhaps also very Nordic flavour. Um, so countries have spent many years focusing on their energy policy and also thinking about the three pillars of energy policy of security, 
sustainability and equity. One of the things that we introduced in 2019 was we also um, introduced proper time series tracking. So that the trilemma now um, goes back in, with data to 2000. Uh, ideally, I'd like to roll it back a bit further, but that's the ability to get some of the data and some of the um, the processing time to pull it all together. So having a look at the top 10 ranks is interesting, but what we also want to see is who's made the biggest improvement and how have they done that. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see here the top 10 um, the top ranks, the overall performance, and you can see that um, Switzerland has the highest score, uh, just above Sweden. Uh, but interestingly, Switzerland has a, a AAA ranking and Sweden has an ABA ranking. Um, so just slightly low on, uh, lower on equity, which has got nothing to do, obviously, with access, but has got to do with cost. And we'll, we'll come down to that when we look at the, the equity dimension. Now, what we've also were able to do now is to look at the the top 10 improvers over the last 20 years. And um, these are the countries don't normally see much about, particularly if we try to focus on the top 10 ranks, but these ones have made some massive improvements. Um, but you can see that if you look at the score, or the grades and the scores, the score's still quite low and the grades are towards the lower end. But if we move on to the, I'm now gonna go through the different dimensions very quickly. So if we move to the next slide, this is energy security. Now on the left-hand side, we have the top 10 uh, ranks um, <clears throat> for energy security, led by um, Canada, who is a significant producer um, and exporter, uh, long-standing IEA OECD member. But we also see Finland and Denmark up there in uh, and Sweden in the in the top 10 as well. Looking at the top 10 improvers, particularly interesting, we have Malta uh, and Cambodia and Jordan being the top three. Now, Malta is very much is included really because and its improvements become it's joining the EU um, with two aspects. There's the, the one, the almost the historic point where they have been building up oil stocks. But the other one I think is probably more significant is actually making sure they got connected to the Italian grid. So it gives them a bit more diversity of supply. Cambodia and Jordan have both done also um, work to ex increase the diversity of their supplies. Cambodia linking up with other grids and Jordan actually getting access to um, other gas supplies. If we move on to the next slide, energy equity. Now, you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, the top 10 ranks are considerably more than um, 10 because we have a lot of countries on tied scores. They split, um, interestingly, between smaller, well-connected countries and Middle Eastern countries with... Uh, cheaper energy costs or subsidized fuels. Um, on the right hand side, you can see those who've made the really big improvements. And this is where UNSGD7 has had, has been particularly impactful. You can see Mozambique has had a 700% improvement. Um, Cambodia's had, in fact, Mozambique, Cambodia, Ethiopia have all had 700% improvement. Um, Tanzania and Kenya, uh, over 600% improvement. The one I particularly highlight is, is Kenya because their improvement was actually in about the last six years and it's very much been with the um, local solar grids and the ability to pay, so you know, that, um, using mobile. So you know, there's some real innovation there to, to drive that forward. And they, Improving energy equity, particularly improving access, has been one of the, the main drivers for um, improving Trilemma score overall. If we move on to the next slide, on to environmental sustainability, you'll see in, in the top 10, um, headed by Switzerland, but 
we have very much a Nordic flavour in the top ten. Sweden number two, Norway number three, um, and we have um, Denmark in um, number ten. Um, here, there's been the improvement uh, top ten is really interesting because we have a mixture of some quite surprising countries like China um, and uh, Ukraine. Uh, some of these start off with very poor systems, um, dirty systems in uh, 2000 and have made um, small improvements, but those small improvements uh, look quite large. But you also include, uh, we have Denmark, which has made, um, had a relatively clean system before and has been making significant efforts to try and uh, decarbonise and improve it further. If we move on to the next slide. So now I want to give a little bit more about the Nordic cluster. So the triangle here on the left-hand side is a composite triangle for um, the five Nordic countries, um, all at the top end of the overarching um, score. So on the over, um, overall ranking, um, we range between a second um, to 22 for Iceland um, on the overall one. Um, on security, slightly less, uh, again ranging between second here for Finland, down to 63 for, um, for Iceland. Equity, it's flipped around a little bit. Here we range from fourth for Iceland down to 31st for, um, for Finland. And for sustainability, um, we go from second to 29th, so from Sweden to, to Iceland. Very strong performance uh, across all three dimensions. Slightly less on equity, but you can see from the earlier slides I've shown, equity slightly skewed there where there are uh, subsidized fuel prices in, in the Middle East. Um, those can be explicitly subsidized or implicitly subsidized because some of the, the, um, the costs, the production costs are so low. If we move on to the next slide, I'm just going to show very briefly the trilemmas for each of uh, the countries. Um, begin with Sweden. Um, so you've seen the scores. And the time series actually looks relatively flat. Um, some general improvement. Um, be interesting that for Klaus to provide a little bit more colour onto that um, point. Um, next one is Denmark, hopefully. Um, here you can see there's that gradual improvement on sustainability from about 2011 onwards. Um, next slide is, should be uh, Norway. Norway, I think, uh, gets treated a little bit harshly under um, the energy security dimension. Um, and it's one, this is where us, we constantly need to keep improving. Um, the problem that Norway has is it's got an awful lot of hydro. So in the way that the calculation looks at it, it's saying it doesn't have much diversity. So it's something we need to keep looking at because I think that's um, that's not quite right. It's, it's underestimating um, the strength of the Norwegian system. Um, if we go on to the next slide, uh, Finland. This was an interesting one here that uh, it looked originally like um, there was decline in environmental sustainability in the early 2000s and improving. Um, so that's something we need to, to follow up with our Finnish colleagues at some point so we can understand a little bit about that. And finally, uh, look at Iceland. Um, again, broadly flat. And I, I think that Iceland, again, is a country that uh, suffers a little bit on, on the security side. Um, that perhaps ought to be a little bit stronger um, there. Next slide, please. What we're trying to do with the trilemma is to move to a um, global, well, a conceptual scalable framework of four different parts, um, a Russian doll, if you will, because um, we want to start off with a global trilemma. The country clusters will use the is the next level down. It uses the same data set, and you've seen what we can do here 
for the Nordic cluster. Um, but we also want to pull out other countries. So maybe, for example, island nations, um, group countries with common um, with themes to see if there are certain aspects we can learn from one another from doing that. The next level down is to look at national trilemmas. Now, for the, the global trilemma, we have to use globally comparable data. This is primarily data from the International Energy Agency, World Bank and others. Um, but there are time lags in that. So it's, it is better if we can do it to be able to use national data, um, which can also then mean that we can tailor the trilemma to look at um, to look at aspects that are actually more useful for national policymakers. Um, New Zealand has been one of the countries we've been talking about um, piloting this with, and we, we're still looking for other countries. So maybe later, Klaus and myself might have a conversation about if I could persuade Sweden to be a, a willing victim for me. Um, but in the conversation with New Zealand, we, we were highlighting how under energy equity, um, energy access is not an issue for New Zealand. It's 100% access. Um, so what what the conversation with uh, our New Zealand colleagues was about was looking at, about fuel poverty, which is very much an OECD European concept, um, but it's it's politically important in New Zealand, and it is something that we are exploring. It's something we'd want to, to do more. So there's the ability to, to flex the national trilemma to, to more align with local priorities. And the new one we're looking at um, beyond that is the, the subnational. Now, this could be either regions of a country, if there's suitable data, or city level. Um, city level it would be very different. Um, it would be looking much more at qualitative data rather than quantitative data. Um, we have had some thinking about this, and what we'd like to do is, again, pilot this with a couple of uh, cities uh, and our aim uh, is for the Congress in 2022 in St. Petersburg to be able to introduce to our, our Russian hosts a Russian doll for the trilemma. So we have the global, a few country clusters, maybe a couple of uh, national pilots and a couple of city pilots um, to, to extend the, the trilemma framework to a broader group. But one of the reasons we're keen to try and push the trilemma down to the city level is linked to my to my final slide. I'm sure you'd be pleased to hear. Um, if we could move there is the humanising agenda. <clears throat> so move to the next slide, please. Um, and this is the aspect that energy is, is much more than just being carbon. It's uh, it's a fundamental driver of human progress. Um, one of the things that uh, we have seen at the council is that too often the energy transition is seen as being a, uh, a technical process that is being applied. And that then means that sometimes you have a reaction against that, that people feel um, excluded from that process and they don't have a say. So you get pushback. So that can be the gilets jaunes in, in France, or it can also be that the social license for some of the change roads. Um, we are very keen that the city level trilemma, that local push, helps start reconnecting and getting people engaged in debating how the energy transition should be shaped. Um, and it's also very much more as we move from being this supply side thinking to those much more demand driven um, solutions, such as the energy aggregators, etc. So, very brief counter through the um, trilemma. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin Young, for this interesting uh, walkthrough. Uh, it's a lot of data, it's a lot of information. Uh, I have a very general question for you. Is it theoretically possible for any country to reach the top grade? of the trilemma index? Yes, I think it is, but it takes time. Um, and the reason why I highlight that is that the top ranking countries are IEA member countries. So they have been focusing on refining their energy policy for 45 years. 
So for a mid-ranking country to charge up to the top and um, replace Sweden, for example, at number two, is they are going to have to um, have a lot of money to do this and learn from others to, and do, um, do better. And I think when you've got such a head start that the, the top-ranking countries have, um, it's going, it's, it's challenging to do, but it would really take time. So the thing that they can, the developing countries can do is they can learn from the mistakes that other countries are making. There are areas that, for example, on um, feed-in tariffs and, and solar panels, um, they can learn from the mistakes that the rich countries have made and avoid those. Um, so they can they can leapfrog in certain aspects. I think that getting up to the, um, I'm really wanting to see uh, a non-IEA country in the top ten. Um, I, that would be a, a real exemplar of a country that has made the most of it, its um, assets uh, and performed really well. And uh, I always find, also find it interesting that there are some of the um, energy you know, significant producers like the OPEC countries, like Russia, they're not in the top 10. You'd have, given their energy heritage, they have not done the best with their, their energy assets. So there are ones who, who should be doing better. Um, but I do want to see um, some of the IEA countries uh, elbowed out of the way by um, other ones. Let's keep a lookout for that. Thank you very much. I want to rem remind the audience that it's possible to send in questions on menti.com. You use the code 72967740. And uh, we will most likely come back to Martin Young with more questions after the other speakers. So we now turn to uh, Klaus Hammes, Chief Economist of the Sweden uh, Energy Agency. Please, Klaus. Remember to unmute your speaker. Teams need to do it in Teams too, not only yes. using my. <laughs> so now you should be able to hear me. And I hope you see me To First, I would like to extend my gratitude to Martin that he could uh, participate or give this extensive talk on the Trilemma report. It was report that I think is uh, very important that Baron Martin has done great work to improve it to something really useful. I've been uh, involved with, with the World Energy Council for at least the last 10 years and I've been uh, in the beginning quite, uh, had my doubts about the report and the methodology, methodology but uh, now we see that the methodology is getting to sound, there's still improvements to be made. But uh, I think uh, now we are really talking about uh, serious work. And uh, I think that much of it is this thanks to Martin and his team. So I'm very happy that you could uh, come and uh, present the report. I think in different, a separate setting, we might talk even a little bit more about some of the issues in the report. Again, from a Swedish perspective, you see Sweden ranks very high on the second place. Of course, it's a little bit bitter that we are beaten by Switzerland, but uh, that depends on the government and the institutional environment where we lose some decimal points, I think. And uh, that is one of the parts that we might have to look into a little bit more because I'm not so clear about the uh, the measurements as an indicator, but uh, that can surely be improved. But on the other end, if you look at the other issues, we see Sweden is ranking very high on the environmental performance, and that is clearly quite in accordance with all of the, the pictures that we in Sweden have for our, ourselves. So we are very aware of the environment, and we have policies in place that actually support environmental support and sustainability. If you look at uh, the setting that we have now with very uh, ambitious goals for the transport sector for 2030 and uh, re reducing emissions by 70 percent, a long run goal to be climate neutral by 2045 and thereafter achieving negative emissions 
and the also the transition of the electricity system, the power system to 100% renewable system by 2040. All those are environment aspects that should uh, affect also the environmental sustainability in the future. But I think um, if I look into the time series on and you showed. Sweden lies quite flat, even though I not would say that we have a, a continuous improvement, and especially that aspect. So, to say. so we'll look into how the how it, the trend trilemma report will look like in maybe 10 years, if there will be all those policies that are in place now on the goals, how those will affect the the index itself, and it should lead to an more and much larger improvement or even higher score on the environmental sustainability in Sweden. And here we have also, for a long time, Sweden has been working with internalizing taxes to try to tackle economic policy instruments to tackle the various types of emissions, like a carbon tax from 1991 that is now around more than 100 euros per ton and that other countries are now more and more getting used to or following. See Switzerland, the number two, number number one also has introduced, introduced a similar system. And in other countries, we have uh, uh, followed the Swedish example. So we are not alone. And that is in some way, of course, making it more difficult to stay on, on top in your ranking. But on the other hand, it's good to see that other countries are following Sweden on that issue, actually. But uh, that is in some way, nevertheless, always re related to a bad position, I think, in the the social sustainability, because that those policies, of course, lead to higher prices because you, inter you use pol economic policy instruments that has an effect on prices. We have energy taxation, we have the carbon tax that I mentioned, and others. So, of course, if you have prices included in the energy and the social su sustainability, then those will, if prices go up, so the social score will go down in in some way. And that is maybe something that needs to be addressed in some way, because if you look into the Nordic countries, all those Nordic countries have very well developed uh, social support schemes. So fending off effects of uh, higher prices, and nevertheless, even Sweden still, at least if you look into electricity prices, electricity pr prices in Sweden are still well below the, the EU average, both for household customers and even lower for industries. And uh, so that at least, and other, uh, of course, uh, the oil and gas, and that those are again exposed to, to environmental taxation. So those prices, of course, are on one hand made on the world market, but on the other hand, also affected by by the Swedish approach to environmental sustainability. So again, maybe a broader picture of how the systems look like in each country might uh, improve the, the aspect, might hopefully improve the Swedish position on the social sustainability. But again, it's difficult to look into each country's uh, so social support schemes and so on. So, but uh, nevertheless, it's interesting to see from a Swedish perspective, also which countries have, have high scores and you see all those countries that are heavily subsidizing renewables or countries like Luxembourg that hardly use taxes for those purposes at all in those sectors. So, but uh, nevertheless, it uh, feels, feels strange from a Swedish perspective to have a relatively low score, so to say, on social, social aspects. Also, the other Nordic countries don't score high, and then again, it's similar reasons for that. So that might uh, create questions to to the WEC or to Martin on the, on that that issue. If we look into energy security, yes, Sweden is has high energy security, and that's 
one reason for that and that we share with the other Nordic countries that we have a well-developed and well-integrated electric power market that we all profit from that have made possible for Denmark to, to achieve higher amounts of wind power integration and with Norway providing you know, hydropower and so on. That has been benefiting energy security and we have a well-developed developed portfolio of uh, countries where we import from so and we should score high on energy security in the long run of course and there are currently some issues on the short run when we look into ca capacity limitations on the internet but that is on the power power grid and so on but that's i leave more up to lena that would probably say something on those issues so the transition that we are seeing in Sweden to 100% renewable light power system and uh, to low carb to an emission free economy will of course have its effects that we we have to take into account and have to fend off but uh, i agree with the energy security again we should maybe even score higher and we would see how the trans energy transition will affect uh, energy security. There are many, many mistakes to be made. On the other hand, we have a lot of studies that show that can be done. And if you know about the problems that you face, then you can tackle the problems. So I think we should even hopefully in the future score even higher on that issue. As I said, the social issue is a different one. And, uh, the environmental performance should increase, increase first. And in some way, I was surprised that Switzerland was high, higher ranking than Sweden. But uh, again, I'm not, too sp I'm not no specialist in, in Switzerland, so we'll dig deeper into that. Then to end this, of course, no one can leave without saying something about uh, about COVID crisis and so on, and the World Energy Council is doing a lot of work on that recently, and I'm very impressed by the output. And we'll see that Sweden is hard hit like all the, all the other countries, but on the other hand, from a stable economy, economy point of view, there is the willingness by the, by the government to support companies and to further to further increase i would say in your your lingo it was more, more uh, what is it? it's a rewind what was it i forgot the name of your but uh, fast, fast forward trying to use the, the crisis to even accelerate the transition in sweden so we will see but uh, given that uh, sweden has not been hit so hard economically as other, other countries that we see around us, there are good chances that we, Sweden can use the COVID crisis to recover quickly and to continue the transition to to future cli climate neutrality. And but uh, again, we will see how, how how Sweden will go through the second wave and. Um, some countries already seem to be coming into a third wave of COVID and all those uncertainties, of course, remain and we'll see for the future how those affects. But in the long run, I think Sweden is on a very good track to achieve its goal and to score even higher. And hopefully next time or two or three years from now, we'll, be, we'll beat Switzerland. With those words, I leave the word back to the moderator, Maya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus, for your uh, perspective. Uh, we do have some questions now uh, popping in from the audience that are directed to Martin Young. Uh, so the first question says, thanks for a very interesting analysis. Do you also analyze energy security at a sub-national level? Could be, there could be large differences within some countries, and for example in Sweden between the south and the north. Hi, it's um, a good question. Um, we don't yet. That's one of the reasons why we want to have the scalable framework. Um, 
I think the the aspect that we would see that affecting on is on resiliency. Um, the moment we have a resiliency indicator based on the Sadian Safi um, electricity supply disruptions, duration and frequency of them, um, that is actually um, when we when we included it, I was delighted we were able to get the data. But I also think that there's um, it's it's a little bit too aggregated for for a country. So I think it'd be really interesting to see that if you were to do the the national trilemma and to break that down a little bit. I think that'd be fascinating. So it's not something we've done. Um, it's something that I would like us to be able to to move into. But we need partners to be able to to look at that. Thank you very much. So potentially we will have time for more questions after the third speaker. So we now move on to Professor Lina Bertling Schenberg. Please. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak with all of you, even though we meet digital, and to discuss about these very important issues of the energy uh, transition. Um, so my role uh, here today is that I'm, I'm one of the members in the National uh, Committee of the World Energy Council in Sweden, and I'm also a professor in power grid technology in Sweden at KDH. So I would like to uh, give two inputs here. Uh, one is some of the reflections of the description we ha heard today, and also to make a little bit remark of what we are doing uh, in Sweden in this topic now. So uh, first of all, uh, from the committee side, we are very happy to thank our inter international invited speaker today, uh, Martin Young. And I think it was very, very interesting to hear about your introduction in overall of the different tools that the World Energy Council are providing for the energy transition, and also specifically uh, about the Trilemma um, report. Um, and what I would like to underline here is that it's very important that we, uh, as a member and a national, that we will contribute to this report. Uh, so it's both a contribution to it, and then also that we are using the results of it. And I think that's the purpose of the meeting today. It's really that, that we would like to encourage all of you to be aware about these results, and we would like to reflect of not only what they mean, but what we can use, how we can use them to do things even better. Um, so what we could see from the report from 2020 was, well, obviously we've said it many times, it was very nice, we could see that Sweden was ranked number two. Uh, but w on the other hand, we could also see in the details in it that we had this issue that on the equity rank, we were number 28, which is quite interesting. And I hope we could come back to, <laughs> if we have time, more discussion of what that really means. Uh, because uh, coming from the scientific part of the world, uh, the first thing I do is to question, what does it really mean? Do I believe in it? And what, what is it beneath that? So if we have time, I would think it would be nice to discuss it even further. Um, in, in the closure of Martin's um, discussion, you were also pointing out um, how we, it's important that we also see the, the people in energy, it's not only the technology, and I think that's very important to stress that again, and also that we see that it's a demand-driven solution that we are searching for, and that I think that's a key for the energy transition. I also would like to stress again um, the concluding work you had, Martin, that it's important here is to learn from others, learn from the best examples, but also learn from the mistakes. So if we have more time at the end, I would ask Martin to give some, if you can give a case, an example. And in this case, maybe it's not important which country it is. It's, it's because we, if we learn from mistakes, uh, the important is to learn from mistakes, not to point out the bad guy. So, so I think that's very important here, that we can learn. Um, I'd like to make a little bit of reflection of, of my colleague uh, Klaus, that, that is also part of our uh, national committee, that has a very long experience um, taking a responsibility for the input for this trilemma report. And I think you're underlying a very interesting discussion on, on the Swedish part of this and how it is, has evolved over time. And we all agree that it is quite interesting to understand the various um, results in, in Sweden and to have a little bit more time to discuss that. Um, so, uh, so my summary would be that I would ask uh, three questions back, uh, if we can give more examples on some good cases, some mistakes we can learn from, and also to give a little more detail on the Swedish, uh, the scale where we had, we were not good ranked. 
Uh, and finally, I also give a little bit of reflection of what's happening in Sweden. Because even though we had a crisis last year, um, for some of us, it was actually more intensive work than ever, not only by being a scientist, a teacher, but also in the energy transition. Because what we can see is that really huge things are happening. Uh, the industry is really um, transforming to um, include a lot of electricity, digitalization, etc. And we should not re rem uh, forget this, because uh, things are really happening, and, and it's really exciting. And that's why I think it's really important that we get on the speed and keep working on this and learn from the good cases. So thank you, and then I will to, well, I'm happy to give you back uh, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lina. So, uh, Martin, we have a few questions then from both Klaus and uh, Lina. So, would you like to highlight some uh, good cases, good examples to learn from? Well, the first thing I should say, uh, and it was really good hearing uh, Lina and Klaus both uh, making um, the comments on it, is that um, <clears throat> I've always regarded the trilemma as uh, it's a, it's a metric, um, and you can, in some aspects, you can start debating about what should be included and what shouldn't be. So what we try to do at the council is have an ongoing dialogue with our members to try and keep improving it. But at the same time, the tool is really there so that it helps support an informed dialogue about trying to improve policy. And so um, it'd be great if, if from this call that people start using the trilemma and have a discussion about highlighting, okay, where are the areas we can improve? Equity is clearly the one, um, and see about what can be done on that. Um, learning from what's good and where mistakes are happening, I think it is exactly where, where you need to try to be using the trilemma. And one of the things that, um, that we see on the trilemma is that where we're producing it, we're looking very much on the data side. And what gives the trilemma strength, because to be honest, a, a lot of people could replicate this. But what allows the council to have more value is that we have our global membership. So our member committees in the different countries, and they then interpret it and provide the, uh, the commentary for the national um, reports. And what we need from from that dialogue is for them to be open and honest about saying this has worked really well, this maybe not so well. Um, and I think sometimes these mistakes can actually be with policies that should have worked, but maybe there was a, a point where, for example, with a feed-in tariff, maybe the feed-in tariff was was fine to begin with, but maybe it should have been it was became overly generous and should have been taken off. Um, I can't think of specific countries that I, I'd want to name, but there, but I do, I think that there are some, for example, with solar who were very keen to begin with, introduced generous feed-in tariffs that were too generous, and then the system collapsed. Um, or should collapse you know that there, there are there are some problems on that one um, but likewise i think one of the the really important things about trial and is to try and look and understand where someone has improved significantly in an area and understand what's the policy and why did it work because just because the policy worked in one country or conversely failed in one country there might be circumstances you know to understand why it worked why it failed and how it could be applied elsewhere and that's debate that we haven't really started doing at the council yet with the trilemma. Um, I think that uh, Klaus's remarks are very kind at the beginning. I think that the trilemma is, I think, is a decent tool, but it's only a good tool if people use it. We have improved it. We've sharpened it. We've now made it a lot better, particularly with the time tracking. But now I think the to be able to answer the, the questions that. Lena had in the class that we now actually have to have that dialogue, have people using it and saying, OK, we can see, just for example, I showed you the timeline for Finland, and we could see that on environmental sustainability, it was declining in the early 2000s, then started improving. 
to have the conversation with um, our Finnish uh, uh, member committee to understand what was happening in the early 2000s in Finland. Why was this declining and what did they do to improve it? Likewise, you know, um, if we could understand from our Danish friends about you know, what were they doing from 2011 onwards that has in, led to their improvement in environmental sustainability. It's those sort of conversations that I think we need to be having and that the council is its, needs to actually leverage the power of its network, which is to, under, you know, to have these experts in different uh, member communities. So no examples, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Would you also like to expand on this uh, most striking surprise that Sweden's scored so low on the equity dimension? Would you like to expand what's included in the equity uh, score? Well, first of all, I I'd like to say that um, I don't think you've done that badly on energy equity. Um, and I wouldn't focus personally, uh, and I in a previous life did a role somewhat like Klaus's actually in the UK government and the ranking's not so much important. I think it's the score that's the important part and to see that you keep improving your score. Now, um, how you compare to other countries is great, but it's really how you're doing, are you making improvements yourself or are you declining? Um, and can you learn from those others to make great improvements? So that's the first, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the rankings. Um, but why does, um, why does relatively do you look like you're not doing so well on equity? As I mentioned at the start, trilemma is something we need constantly improving. Um, on the top of my head, I actually say that overall, I think security scores are potentially too low. I think the equity scores on average are too high um, because I think it's ridiculous that, um, and I'm criticising my own tool here, um, but... If you look at the top scoring country um, on equity, it's Luxembourg, and it's got something like 99.7. That's the implication of that is Luxembourg can't improve, you know, has very little scope for improvement. And that's wrong. So we need to actually, it's one of the things I want to look at because I think the equity dimension is a little bit too skewed and it's, we need to reframe it. Um, I actually think the environmental sustainability score is about right. So at least the one aspect we're Okay, it's just a little bit of rescaling needs to go around. Um, what can Sweden do about equity? I think the access is not an issue. Um, so it's much more about um, the affordability. And I think it's the point that um, I think Klaus touched upon. You have higher energy prices, but they're there for a purpose. They're there to try and make sure people use um, energy in a sensible way. So I wouldn't be... I, I think this is one where if I were in Klaus's shoes, I'd be arguing, saying, that's fine, I'm happy to have the lowest score on that before it is for very good reasons that we have that score. Um, but to see you know, if there are issues about fuel poverty, that would be the way that I would be focusing on trying to address that. Thank you very, very much. So we do have time for one last question from the audience. Um, how are energy efficiency and customer flexibility strategies treated in the trilemma? Would heavy investment in efficiency benefit? Uh, would heavy investment in efficiency benefit the sustainability or the energy security dimensions? It would in, actually it would um, improve both but it would particularly improve the, uh, the sustainability dimension. There is, under sustainability, we do have an indicator for um, energy intensity. Um, there, there's not too many data points for energy um, intensity because you're basically looking at energy production, comparing it to GDP. Um, we constantly try and find if there are, are new indicators out there. Um, but if you can improve that, it obviously means you're using less energy, you're using it more efficiently. So it improves both parts. Um, and it is one aspect that um, a number of countries have improved their uh, their energy efficiency, um, which is also being why that 
that score has improved for, for various countries. Thank you. Um, with that, we have to conclude this uh, today's webinar. I do hope that the webinar will just be the start of several discussions uh, overall, globally and nationally. Uh, and I would like to thank Martin Young, Klaus Hammes and Lina Bertling Schernberg uh, for being part of this discussion here today. Thank you very much and uh, let's hope the discussion goes on. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Ellen, is the broadcast over? Mm -hmm.